Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome to this uh, first session in uh, the scholarly communication series that the Himmelfarb Library is putting on. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce Dr. Bart Trawick. Uh, Dr. Trawick has worked at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, uh, the National Library of Medicine, since 2000. He is currently the Literature Resources Lead at NCBI, which encompasses PubMed, PubMed Central, Bookshelf, and the NIH Manuscript Submission System. He was in charge of developing and running the system at its inception in 2005, when the then voluntary NIH public access policy was announced. Since that time, over four million articles have been archived in PubMed Central. He is the product manager for MyNCBI, which includes the tools SciNCV and My Bibliography. Researchers can use SciNCV to quickly fill out an NIH, NSF, or IES biosketch profile in My Bibliography and use it to store their supported citations and associate them with awards for reporting on the RPPR. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Trowick. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here today. Straight down the red line. I'm going to talk today about the NIH public access policy, um, how the extramural and intramural funded scientists are required to ensure that their <clears throat> NIH funded research is archived and made publicly accessible for people. And I'll take a little time to talk about funding and the money because it always follows the money and the funding, um, how the policy came about, and what tools that we have that enable scientists to ensure that their publications are archived in our central repository. There's more than one method. There's actually four different ways for them to comply with the policy. And finally, we've built another tool that helps scientists to apply for money, which is called SciNCV. It's a biosketch tool that is part of the grant application process. So scientists can fill out these biosketches, which is like a little mini CV, so they can apply for money. So to begin with, the National Institutes of Health is comprised of 27 different institutes and centers. My institute is the National Library of Medicine. Each of these has a portion of the NIH budget that they then portion out uh, according to their research goals and plans. The annual budget for NIH is approximately $31 billion. Um, there was a bit of a kerfuffle this past week when the President's proposed budget came out, and that proposal has a 25% decrease in funding for NIH. But what Congress decides to pass is completely up to them and has no bearing necessarily on what the proposed budget is. But you'll see that the majority of the money that comes into NIH immediately goes out and funds grants all across the U.S. And there's even an international branch, the Fogarty International Center, that funds some international researchers. It's a big uh, industry that scientists get into with applying for grants. And it's a cycle that they feel like they're constantly being involved in because Currently, about 12 to 13 percent of grant applications are successfully funded. So there's a lot of pressure for them to make sure that they're keeping their laboratories funded and they're constantly putting in grant proposals and checking out and making sure that there are opportunities that they're putting their proposals in for. And it's, it's kind of a long process. It takes almost a year for the time when they write their grant application and it goes into receipt and referral, and this is the organization that decides where the proposal should go to, what institute would be most likely to fund it. And then it goes through a review application process. It's almost like a peer review where scientists kind of get together and they evaluate and judge the merits of the different grant proposals. The two tools that I'm going to talk about today kind of work on opposite sides of this grant cycle. Science EV is the biosketch tool that they would use to make an NIH biosketch for, as part of their application. And my bibliography helps them after they've obtained an award, and they're making sure that they fully comply with 
the NIH public access policy. So the policy came about uh, in 2008. The mandate for the policy was in a federal appropriations bill. This is how NIH and other federal agencies receive their money for the fiscal year. And occasionally there'll, there'll be some mandates that come across in this law instructing the NIH to do things. And in the 2008 Appropriations Act, they required that the director of NIH uh, create a policy to ensure that NIH-funded investigators have archived their peer-reviewed research in PubMed Central. Um, they worked with NIH in establishing the fine details of this law and made sure that it only applied to peer-reviewed manuscripts and not other types of materials. They also provisioned for a 12-month embargo to be part of this uh, deposit. The articles are deposited into PubMed Central, not in PubMed, and we get a lot of scientists that come to us that are confused. They're like, my articles are already in PubMed. I don't understand what else I have to do. I explain, well, PubMed and PubMed Central there are two different things, PubMed being the index citations and abstracts and PubMed Central being the full text articles. And I tell my parents that PubMed's like TV Guide. You can see what's on there. But if you really want to watch the show or read the whole article, you have to go to PubMed Central to retrieve it. And that has everything. It's all the figures and all the supplemental materials. If they mention a gene that's in one of our gene databases, we'll have a link directly to that gene sequence. Uh, references to other PubMed Central articles are automatically linked up as well. So it's a very nice, rich archive resource. Currently has over 4 million articles that are archived in PubMed Central. 2,000 of these are from full participation journals. And this is a journal that signed an agreement with National Library of Medicine to provide all their content directly to the National Library of Medicine. So the National Academies of Science is one of the uh, journals that does this, uh, PLOS, a large number of, of journals have entered into this type of agreement with us. Um, there's a small number of NIH portfolio journals, and what this is is these are journals that said, well, we'll give you all the NIH-funded content. And selective deposit are journals that have an agreement where if the author pays like an open access fee, then they'll, oops, then they will deposit that article into PubMed Central. And the reason that we really stress to scientists it's great to have it archived in PubMed Central besides complying with the policy is that there's a lot of use. There's almost 2 million people daily that are going and accessing the content. 4 million articles on a daily basis are accessed. So that's, you know, 4.2 million total, 4 million, you know, that's not all spread evenly across, of course, but there's a lot of use of this resource, and it's been growing year, <clears throat> year upon year. So we tell them, you know, it's great, you can publish where you want to publish, and then you make sure that everybody has access to it, at least in PubMed Central. Now, the policy is a public access policy, and, and it's not open access, and people get confused, well, what's the difference between open and public access? With open access, the <clears throat> users are free to use and distribute these articles on their own servers if they want. They can make derivative works from it. And the key factor is that it's available immediately upon publication. This is kind of the gold standard for open access. For public access, all the content that falls under public access policy, copyright is still owned by the journal itself. Um, so you can't just set up download all the articles from PubMed Central and put your own server up and then distribute it as you want. Um, also, there is this embargo clause where if a journal would like for the article to be embargoed for up to a year, there's a provision for you in the submission process to set what this embargo period is. So that's, that's the fine details between public and, and open access. So the policy went into effect in 2008. It applies to at least the final peer-reviewed manuscript that's been accepted by the journal for publication. So it's gone through peer review. There might have been a round or two of corrections 
or additional experiments that the scientist has done. And once the journal has said, now, yes, this version is fine, we're going to publish it, that's the version that, as a minimum, has to be archived in PubMed Central. So it hasn't gone through copy editing, um, lots of other things that the journal might do to it. Um, it doesn't matter if NIH was part of it. You know, many things are funded by several grants. It might be other agency grants. As long as NIH had some part in supporting that publication, whether it was through a grant or an intramural scientist that's a federal employee was part of the process, it covers any of those works. But it does not cover any outside stuff like book chapters and editorials, conference proceedings, posters, letters to the editors, things like that. It's focused on the peer-reviewed publications. There are four ways to make sure that what you've published is, gets archived into PubMed Central. So on the right, PubMed Central is what you're shooting for, archived in PubMed Central. You can have the first two A and B pathways have your final article being archived. So if you publish in one of those full participation journals, there's almost 2,000 of those. If you publish in PLOS or Proceedings of National Academy of Science, that automatically, that publisher will automatically put all the content into PubMed Central so the author has nothing else to do. Method B is if they publish in one of these journals that allows for open access. They might pay an additional fee of two to three thousand dollars and that will get archived into PubMed Central. And NIH will support these open access fees. They, the investigator can recover it as part of their grant. The methods C and D are for capturing the manuscripts that publishers that don't participate directly with PMC. So this is your Elsevier, Nature, Science. Um, if those types of uh, publishers are not interested in providing the final published version, then your manuscript version is what gets submitted into PubMed Central. You can either submit this yourself, that's what method C is, and method D is some publishers will come in and deposit the manuscript for you, and then the author will come in and, and approve it along the conversion process. So in the, in the top section, this is method A and B. This is where the publisher directly supplies the content to PubMed Central of the final published article. They supply it in the form of XML, so everything's already marked up, all the full-size figures, and they'll also supply a PDF of the final published article. So users of PubMed Central can get either of these versions. These publishers also have special branding, so you know that this was the final published version as it appeared in the journal that you're accessing on PubMed Central. And with the manuscript pathway for methods C and D, this involves a little more work because the author has to come in and either submit the manuscript files themselves, it might be Word document, it might be a PDF, whatever format the journal required is fine to submit to us the process. Or the publisher might supply these files. But in either case, the author does have to come in, make sure that the submission is complete, they kind of review it, and they'll approve it. We'll send out these manuscripts for conversion in the PMC XML. So they take the Word document, they mark it up into XML, goes through a couple rounds of QA, and then it's ready to be loaded into PubMed Central. After it's completely marked up and ready to be loaded to PubMed Central, we ask the author to come back one more time just to make sure and see that the conversion from the Word document looks like it should be on the web rendered version. When these appear in PubMed Central, it has a distinct banner saying that this is the author manuscript version, it's not the final published version, and there will be a link to the final published version available at the publisher site. But whether you have access to it or not depends on if you're accessing it from your university and they have a subscription to that journal and whatnot. Uh, submitting to NIHMS, if you have this manuscript and you're ushering it through the process, it's, it's relatively painless. We try to keep it to a very minimum, the amount of information that you have to supply, you just have to tell us what journal 
accepted it for publication, you give a manuscript title, how it was funded um, through the NIH funding and the files themselves, including the supplemental files. And it takes about two or three weeks to go through the conversion process, and then we'll contact the PI again and say, hey, everything looks fine, just take a look for yourself and make sure you're happy with it. And once they approve it, we'll load it into PubMed Central and assign it a PubMed Central ID. The, <clears throat> the PMC ID is how the grants office tracks that they're being compliant with the public access policy. And PIs have gotten very cognizant that this is the golden ticket that they're looking for. If there was an embargo, then we will apply that once we see that the article was actually published. So for every manuscript that comes through, we're constantly looking through the PubMed database to match it up to a PubMed citation. And once we've matched it to a PubMed citation and we see the publication date, that's what we base release into PubMed Central off of. If it's immediate upon publication, it just goes right in. And if there's an embargo, then we'll hold it for six to 12 months. The <clears throat> manuscript submission system initially started in 2005 is when we opened, but the policy wasn't mandatory in 2008. So when it was a voluntary policy, that's when it's down low on the graph. You know, we didn't have a whole lot of people that were interested in doing this. But as soon as you put the stick into effect and said, all right, now your grant is contingent upon making sure that all your publications are archived, then we saw this huge spike. We currently handle over 8,000 manuscripts monthly. So that's a really a large number, about what close to 100,000 annually of publications coming through that route. So how does the researcher kind of manage all this? You know, when they're at the stage of not knowing the difference between PubMed and PubMed Central, it's really nice to give them like an extra tool to kind of show what's compliant with the policy and what's not and, and which ways they need to go. So what we've done is, is we have an existing system at NCBI called MyNCBI. And this is a toolbox that anybody that uses our web services can sign up for an account. And you have access to many different features that work with our website. So you can set up uh, saved searches if, if you're constantly coming to PubMed and running a query for your uh, research interests like uh, colon cancer or whatever search term you have. And it could be a nice, complicated PubMed query term. You can save this into your profile and have the system automatically email you on a weekly basis and give you all the new hits that match that particular query. Um, there's several other ways to organize information on these free accounts that you can set up. You can have little collections where you can save PubMed articles or PubMed Central articles and genetic information from one of our other databases. So it's built to kind of interact with all the different databases that we have at NCBI. When you're at one of our web pages, we have a sign-in link on the very top right, if you're in PubMed or one of our genome databases, you click on that, and we give you several different options to sign in with. So if you have a Google account, you can just use that to log in. For NIH-funded investigators, they manage their grants through a system called ERA Commons. And so we encourage that those PIs use ERA Commons to log in and set up an NCBI account. Because once they've done that, now we know, aha, you, you're a funded investigator, and then we have a linkage, and we, we know which grants have been awarded to you. Any profile information that you have in the common system, you can bring in, and we make your life much easier when you fill out a biosketch, for example, in Science TV. And the nice thing is this federated login, it lets you sign in through several different ways at the same time if you want. So we kind of describe a MyNCBI account is like a room, and these different login methods are like extra doors that you can put in. So if, if you're always on Google and you have a Google account, you can link that to your NCBI account and sign in with your Google credentials. You can manage all these linked accounts. We have a personal preference page. Once you're signed in, if you just click on your username, we have a linked account section. 
where you can add and subtract different login routes. Also at the very bottom, we allow for delegation. So if a PI is too busy to kind of come in and manage this information for themselves, then they can sign off and have an administrative assistant that goes in and, and manages their bibliography and manages Science V if they're interested in making biosketches. So when you sign into MyNCBI, we have this nice dashboard, and each of these little windows is a tool that's integrated with our databases. In the upper left, you have a way to search databases. Um, save searches is at the bottom in this particular picture, and you can pull these panels around. You can set it up exactly how you want it so that information that's important to you is exposed as soon as you get there. The My Bibliography tool it allows you to enter citations in many different ways, PubMed being a quick and easy way to add citations to your bibliography. You can also add manual citations for things that are not in PubMed. Maybe it was in a, a physical science journal or a book chapter or something that PubMed doesn't capture. You're able to set up citations for that. And you can also bulk upload. So once you've added all your citations in, we, we run some tools in the background. So there's a little related PubMed citations tool that looks at the corpus of all the PubMed IDs that you've put into your bibliography. And then we say, hey, you might be interested in these articles that map closely to what you've put into your bibliography. So it kind of shows you what's going on in your field. And you simply just have to add your publications into my bibliography to get that. And we have many different citation types. We allow for patents and presentations and book chapters. NIH is getting interested in the uh, scientific output of researchers beyond just peer-reviewed publications. So they might have a medical device that they've invented or a patent or something like that. So we've been expanding my bibliography to capture these other types of scientific output. So how does my bibliography help the PI that has a grant to manage all this information? Well, the advantage is, you know, I showed you there's four different ways to get your articles into PubMed Central. And my bibliography kind of sits on top of all these databases and it's able to scan all this information. So if, for instance, you submit a manuscript to the manuscript submission system, part of that submission process is you link it to a grant that you have that will automatically populate your bibliography with that manuscript submission. And as soon as the manuscript staff link it to a PubMed citation, we update that citation in your bibliography. So it goes from just a manuscript citation, we update it to the PubMed citation once that's available. And once it's archived in PubMed Central, we'll update the citation automatically again and add that PubMed Central ID. That's what scientists are required to report on, that's what their program official is looking for on their annual progress reports. And that's where this information all gets transmitted over to ERA Commons. ERA Commons is where a scientist manages their grant. They're required every year to fill out a progress report on the grants that have been awarded to them, what has been the output, what publications have you had come out of this, what other information, so my bibliography kind of captures all the information about articles being archived in PubMed Central, and then it automatically populates the grant report for the PI when they go to make that. It also kind of takes a look at everything in their bibliography and takes the guesswork out for the PI. It lets them know if something is fully compliant with the policy, if it has that PubMed Central ID, we give them a little green light and a link to the PubMed Central record. If it's been added uh, to a journal that is going to submit the article to PubMed Central directly, it doesn't have a PMC ID yet, we know that. This is a journal that has entered into an agreement. We expect to see the final published article. It's in process, nothing to worry about. And then for articles that don't come from one of these journals, and you've put it and you've linked it to your grant, if it's three months past the publication date and we don't have a record of it yet, you know, you get a red mark just right at the top. It alerts them, hey, 
I got to do something about this because it's been linked to my grant and it's not archived in PubMed Central yet. So as soon as they load in all of their citations and they've linked it to this ERA Commons account, so we know they're funded, they have certain grants, we automatically do this calculation for all those citations that are in there. If it's a book chapter, public access policy doesn't apply to that, they're off the hook. If it's been submitted through the manuscript submission system, it's being processed, everything's fine. If it's three months after publication and we don't have any record of it yet, that's when they get the warning alert. And it's set up so that PIs can share this information with each other. So here's an example where they've, they've put in a, uh, added a PubMed citation. The PI is like, okay, what, do I, what am I supposed to do next? And they can click on this compliance status link and it asks them, hey, did NIH fund this, yes or no? And if it did, it gives them all the different options for bringing this publication into compliance. They can either begin the submission in the manuscript submission system, they can link it to one that's already been submitted, but maybe it just didn't have the grant associated with it, or they can claim an exemption. Like, actually, this citation that appears in PubMed, it wasn't peer reviewed. It was just a big, long letter to the editor. So they can let us know that, and then we'll mark it as not applicable, and they won't get dinged on their progress report. They can also go in and quickly link all the grants that they have that supported it. When they fill out their progress report, it's always tied to a particular grant that they have. So if they link it to that grant, we'll make sure that that article will appear in their progress report. And if they collaborate with other PIs, which is very common, they can link their collaborators' grants and then we'll automatically take that publication, we'll put it into the collaborator's account as well. If somebody does that, if someone links it to your grant, we give you an alert as soon as you go to your bibliography and say, hey, somebody linked this to your grant, they're able to check it and let us know, well, yeah, that looks fine, or hey, this is a mistake, I don't want this grant, my grant linked to it. So they have that op option to kind of override it. And when they fill out this progress report, this is where it gets real. This is where everything is listed that's been linked to that grant since the last reporting period and whether it's compliant or not is immediately listed in one of those columns. And PIs work with a program official and they program official reviews these and that's the first thing they look for. They're like, hey, we have something out of compliance here, you know, what happened? Oh, I didn't know what to do. Well, then we have staff that can kind of guide them along to make sure that they get their manuscript or article archived in PubMed Central. NIH has this report website where you can actually look up any grant number in any field and you can see all of the articles that have been tagged with that grant. You can find them in PubMed Central. It's, it's very interesting to see uh, how taxpayer money comes out and it goes and it funds these various uh, avenues of research and then you can see you know, what came out of it, what were all the products that this grant produced. So we first built this My Bibliography piece and it, it helped to support this grant reporting and compliance section. It helps the PIs, it helps NIH program officials kind of track all this information. And then we decided that it would be nice to kind of extend this since PIs are coming in, they're maintaining these bibliographies, you know, wouldn't it be nice to kind of give them another tool that they can use off of all this information that they're building up for it. And that was part of what led us to create Science TV, which is this biosketch tool that allows the scientists to kind of set up a quick little profile for their grant application process. And it came about as a request from an interagency working group that said, you know, look, all the different federal agencies that fund science kind of have a similar requirement for a biosketch, and everybody has a different format, but you're basically asking the same questions. You know, what's your name? Where'd you go to school? What are some of your publications? So they, they, they ask that they make it easier for people interested in applying for science grants, you know, hey, kind of 
Maybe if you can't standardize it across all the agencies, at least you can make it so that the data can flow a lot easier from one format to another. So that was what the driving force behind Science CD was, was kind of PIs are already maintaining these bibliographies of all the things that they've that's been funded by their grants. We have captured information on uh, who they are. We know because we've linked it to their ERA Commons profile account. So Science CD kind of allows them to kind of pull all this information in and, and quickly make a biosketch from it. We offer several different options. They can make a biosketch from scratch. We give them a blank sheet and they kind of fill in the forms as they go along. Or they can use an external source of information. So if they have an ERA Commons account with a grant that they manage already, we pull all that information in and pre-populate the biosketch for them. And then they can tailor it to exactly how they want it to be. And they can also copy an existing biosketch and then make a new biosketch out of that. So generally when, when PIs are applying for grants, they're applying for a specific area and so they like to have a biosketch is very tailored to show their expertise in a particular grant application. So even though they might have wide research interests in different areas, they might, you know, want a biosketch, you know, particularly for the Kidney Institute grant opportunity. And it's nice because the biosketches, they have all the administrative requirements about what font size it has to be and how big the margins are supposed to be, and Science you kind of takes all that out for them. They just fill in the form, and then we kind of make sure that it completely conforms to what the administrative requirements are. They have complete control over the data, so even if they pull it in from an external source, if it's populated uh, their education section, for instance, they can go in and make little adjustments. Um, sometimes the data that comes from their grant system will have their university in all caps, so they can go in and override it and make it look pretty if they'd like. If, uh, if they've populated their bibliography, these are automatically available to them. So they just pick the ones off from their bibliography that they want to include in their biosketch. The biosketch for NIH has undergone a change. It used to be um, that the PI could report 25 citations, and now they've reworked that. They wanted to, NIH was interested in kind of de-emphasizing what journals people published in and allow scientists to have more of a narrative about their scientific careers. So now they are able to fill out this particular section, section C, with uh, four different sections, and each of these can have five publications each. So they're able to go in and say, you know, maybe there was a gap in their research if they had children and took some time off. They could explain that to a reviewer. They don't just, you know, automatically look, scan for the journals and look for gaps in years for their publications. For PIs that have linked to either an ORCID account or to their ERA Commons account, all the grant information that you have in those systems automatically populates. So you can pick which grants you want to include in the biosketch for this particular application. And when the PI is ready to submit this as part of the grant application package, they're required to submit it as a PDF. And they just click a button and we produce one on the fly from everything that they've entered into the system, perfectly formatted with the one-inch margins, exactly like NIH wants, the exact font. Um, and we do a special little trick. We also take all the structured data that went to make this biosketch and we add it as an attachment to that PDF. So when it goes through the grant process and they submit it to grants.gov and that goes to NIH, that NIH can actually then pull the information out of the biosketch and enter it into their system so they're able to quickly track that application. So MyNCBI has these specialized tools, My Bibliography, which lets you kind of track all your science-funded, peer-reviewed products, and if you do the work to do that, 
you get Science TV and you get to add all that information in to make biosketches to apply for more grants so we can continue the cycle and publish even more. We see uh, lots of PIs that have been using Science TV. We have about 75,000 accounts set up and one to 200 people a day are downloading biosketches out of the system and scientists are you know, putting links to their public Science TV pages on their faculty website. So there's, a, there's uptake in using the system to promote themselves and set up these biosketches. So I've kind of, I've kind of tore through this really fast. Uh, I've added some links for documentation, uh, where to find Science TV. We have YouTube videos that kind of give you a quick little overview, three, four minute overview of how to use the system. Um, and you can find all the information on the public access policy at a special NIH page. And we love feedback. And at the very bottom, you can write into NCBI at info at ncbi.gov. I'm happy to take any questions for you. So thank you very much, mm -hmm. Dr. Trawick. So at this point, um, does anybody have any questions for Dr. Trawick, either online? Yes? I work. Um, Oh, I should mention, um, my name's Megan. I'm the um, Metadata Scholarly Publishing Librarian here. Um, one of my roles in the library is interlibrary loan. And um, what I've seen is that um, whenever we can find the uh, full text access um, for articles, even if they're um, accepted manuscripts through PubMed Central, we generally send those to the requester. And they seem to be, um, you know, they seem to treat those as the publisher's version. Um, I guess my question is, in as you've seen the numbers go up for compliance with the policy, have you seen a shift in, um, do, do our researchers starting to accept um, the accepted manuscript as the version that they want to use when they're, um, you know, in their own research or that they want to cite? So we've, we've, we've taken a look at what are the differences between the manuscript version accepted for publication versus what actually makes it out. And oftentimes, there's these journal styles that are applied. So the manuscript would have figure one written out, figure two. The journal style is fig.1, fig.2. So there's often just minor little changes like that. And um, honestly, the scientists just want to get their hands on it. And whatever's the quickest way, if they're at home, for instance, when they're going through PubMed and they find an article, and there's a link to the publisher, they might not have access to it, and if they have it in PMC, they just they take it and run. And I think people are getting so used now to just reading stuff on the screen that having that you know, published two-column PDF type version is not quite as important to them anymore. Um, and there's advantages when you read it on the screen. You can control F to find stuff. So we have, we have seen a shift. Are there any other questions from the floor at this point? Um, Megan, are there any questions that have come in over WebEx? Myself. Um, so I was, uh, I gave a presentation a couple months ago to a department um, on ORC ID or ORCID uh -huh. um, as an author identifier. And we at the library, um, my colleagues and I are actively um, trying to push out org, org ID because it's becoming more adopted by publishers and is starting to be required by some. Um, I know in your presentation you mentioned that org ID and Science CV can talk to each other and they are linked. Um, can you talk um, a little more about that? Certainly. So um, org ID is a, a very nice system in that it's not it's a not for profit. It's not aligned with any of the publishers, so it kind of sits above all of them. And it is intended to be a person disambiguation product so that, you know, if I'm John Smith and there's hundreds of other John Smiths, you know, I'm able to register for this free ID and then I can kind of use that to identify myself when I go to different publishers. If you go to a publisher that requires an ORC ID and you put it into their publishing system, we, PubMed will accept these from publishers directly that submit citations to PubMed. You can search PubMed via ORC ID. 
Um, Science TV takes a, a step further in that we actually, when you link your ORCID account to Science TV, we can access an AP, their API so that all the information you set up on your ORCID profile can be brought in to populate your biosketch. And that's what makes it really nice because in your ORCID profile, they ask for your education and different publications, the different ways to populate it. With Scopus has this really nice way that pulls in all the information into your ORCID account. If you spend time making a nice ORCID profile, you come to Science TV, all that data is available. You can just pull it right into your biosketch. So that's how those two are integrated. NIH is getting very interested in applying this even more and possibly looking to link ORCID IDs to grantees in their grants database. So we, we have had you know, a positive experience working with Science TV and they're investigating to expand that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I actually have a, a couple of questions. And, um, my first one actually follows up quite nicely from this, which is uh, ORCID does work very nicely with Science TV. So I like to think of it as a sort of scientist's greatest hit, if yeah. you like, where you can highlight your contributions to science. Um, but are there any plans to pull in bibliographic data from some of the other partners? For instance, NSF have their own public access repository, the IES use ERIC. Right. Um, so we are looking at that. Unfortunately, one of the challenges is that each of these different repositories will have their own data structure and data model. And if you go around and you try to make a converter that will work with each of these, you can kind of you know, die a death of a thousand cuts. So instead what we're doing is we've begun to build um, an API that's kind of like a common data model so that other agencies can partner with us and we'll be able to kind of access information from these different repositories. And that actually follows, uh, uh, helps me with my follow-up question, which is that other federal agencies uh, have uh, recently uh, opted to use their own pre-existing article repositories, um, or they use Chorus to notify them when research funded by them is published. So there are still many entry points a researcher has to search for government-funded research in medicine, the health sciences, and public health. Uh, where do you see the potential for collaboration to make this information easier to find? And what I mean by that is, uh, do you have any sort of insights into whether you will be sharing uh, your data with Google Scholar or with any other search system? That's interesting. So G Google Scholar is a, is a very popular way to access um, information from PubMed. And it's nice because it can spread out to other data repositories. So we are very keen when we do our search engine optimization that Google's able to access our abstracts and pull all that information into it. So we do make our systems as friendly to that type of data mining as possible. And uh, um, many uh, principal investigators of clinical translational science grants and public health grants have to provide evidence of community engagement and impact in their progress reports. Um, how might Science CV be able to pull in uh, bibliographic data for gray literature, such as community impact reports that are not published in a journal, but are on a website or a repository somewhere? So, as you mentioned, NIH is getting very interested in this different ways that people are producing scientific products. And we're currently adding additional citation types for these preprint repositories or other types of repositories. And we're working with Crossref so that if they do rep deposit one of these other repositories and they obtain a DOI for their work, that they can then pull that into my bibliography and then it can populate into their Science TV account. And NIH policy is also making it permissive for scientists that are filling out these biosketches for grain applications that they can use these other types of work. It's not just limited to peer-reviewed publications that they can add things that they uh, have as gray literature, white papers, or something like that. So we are expanding out. Are there any other questions? Okay, well, um, thank you very much, Bart.
and uh, um, I just want to uh, mention that this is the first in uh, our series of updates in scholarly communications. Our next um, broadcast will be next Wednesday, March the 29th at 12 p.m. Uh, and you can register for that by going to the events section of the Himmelfarb Library website. And so thank you very much for your time. And uh, now I think we'll terminate the recording. <laughs>